So we've completed the total arc across the week and we can summarize it as saying Sunday is, let's just say long endurance. Monday is leg resistance training. Tuesday, heat, cold contrast. Wednesday, torso training plus neck. Thursday, I would call it moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. So that 35 minute moderate intensity cardiovascular exercise. Friday, high intensity interval training of sprinting or some uh, variation thereof. And Saturday, arms, calves, neck, and torso indirect work. That's the total structure. But I want to emphasize again, you do not need to start this on Sunday. That is, you could make the long endurance work start on Tuesday and then just fill in the rest as described before. It's really up to you. There's another important point I want to make, which is that neither I nor anyone is going to be successful in doing the exact workouts on the exact same days of every week because of travel, work, illness, other demands, et cetera. The thing about the schedule that I like so much and that I do believe that will benefit you as well is that you have some flexibility there. What's the flexibility? Well, let's say you train your typical Sunday workout of endurance, then you train legs on Monday, and then you don't manage to do your heat cold contrast on Tuesday for whatever reason. Well, you can put it on Wednesday, just make sure that if you're going to do the cold stimulus that you don't do it too close, not within four, ideally eight hours after the training of torso, but you could do it before, or you could do it just heat and skip the cold that particular week, all right? Not ideal, but better than not doing anything. Let's say for instance, the leg workout was particularly brutal. You don't sleep that well on Monday night or Tuesday night. Well, then should you do the torso workout on Wednesday? Well, I would say, why not move the heat cold contrast to Wednesday and then push that torso workout to Thursday and maybe also try and do that 35 minute run on Thursday every once in a while, rather than lose the total control of the program and let everything shuffle forward. Here's the basic principle. I do believe that any one of these workouts, whether it's for endurance or resistance training can be shifted either one day forward or one day back, right? You could delay it by a day or you could accelerate it by a day in order to make sure that you get everything done across the week. In fact, I would say the best way to think about this foundational fitness program is not from the details up, but from the top down, from the big picture down to the details and say to yourself, once a week, you're going to get some long endurance in. Another day during the week, you're going to make sure that you get a kind of moderate, faster endurance workout in. And then one other day during the week, you're going to get an all out sprint, high intensity cardiovascular exercise workout in. You're going to get those three workouts in somehow. And then in addition to that, you will also do resistance training for every muscle group in your body. And that means doing your legs hard at least once a week, your torso hard at least once a week, and your arms hard at least once a week. And of course, you are also paying attention to train your calves. And I do, for reasons I described before, believe that you want to train your neck at least to keep it strong. You may not want to generate hypertrophy there. People vary in terms of how quickly their neck grows. Some people grows very, very fast. Other people, for the life of them, they can't get much hypertrophy in their neck, but keeping that neck strong, at least through some very light work to moderate weight work, very, very important for reasons I stated earlier. If you set out those goals, then the specific days that you do each workout isn't as critical, but the specific spacing is. So for instance, you're not going to want to do your high intensity interval training the day after you train your legs, because if you're doing that high intensity, you're doing that high intensity interval training correctly, you're going to be taxing your legs and eating into their recovery. And so you want to space them out by two or three days. So I think you'll notice that the point is really to optimize everything on the whole, rather than any one specific aspect of training or adaptation. Now that said, I do realize that some people might be hyper-focused on things like strength and hypertrophy and the aesthetics that come with it. A key point about strength, hypertrophy and weight training. And this is something that has been covered on multiple podcasts, certainly the one with Jeff Cavalier and with um, Dr. Andy Galpin and the one that I did on um, building muscle strength and hypertrophy, the solo episode. And that is the following. It is the rare individual who has perfectly balanced musculature, right? Most people 
can be a bit quad dominant or hamstring dominant, or they have trouble activating their glutes, or somebody has a terrible time trying to activate their, their chest muscles, but they're very strong in the back, et cetera. It's very clear that we can know that not just based on aesthetics, right? But based on deliberate contractibility of those muscles. So I don't wanna get into this in too much detail for sake of time, but this is something that has peer reviewed research to support it and was also discussed extensively with Jeff Cavalier when he was a guest. And that actually he's really popularized this notion and it's absolutely true, which is that if you can contract a muscle very hard to the point where it almost feels like it's cramping, if you can do that, even when there's no weight in your hand or there's no resistance against it, so you're just using your mind muscle connection to contract that muscle hard and isolate it, chances are you will be able to generate hypertrophy and strength gains pretty easily in that muscle compared to muscles that you have a harder time activating. So during all resistance training, that mind muscle link is really important. Uh, so much so that some people will even try and emphasize contraction of the muscles in between sets, et cetera. I personally, because I'm not somebody who uh, likes a mirror when I work out, and I'm not somebody who um, wants to spend time in between sets flexing muscles and et cetera, uh, for whatever reason, I wanna actually rest between sets. And I'm more concerned with performance during those sets and really putting my mind into the muscle during the set. I really try and emphasize deep relaxation between sets. And so here's a, a tool that again is built out of science and I should say peer reviewed studies, some of which are being done in my lab, but other labs as well, which is that in between sets, what I really strive to do is to bring my heart rate down as much as possible, calm myself down as much as possible. And I'll do the so-called physiological sigh in order to do that. That's two inhales through the nose, back to back. And then long, full exhale, through the mouth. I just did it partially there for sake of time again. So a big deep inhale through the nose and then sneak in a little bit more on a second inhale to maximally inflate the lungs and the alveoli of the lungs and then a full exhale of all your air via the mouth to empty your lungs. That's the fastest way that we are aware of to calm your nervous system down. And really in between sets, you can use that to calm yourself down and conserve energy. But then as you move into the weight training set, you really want to ratchet up your focus and attention to the muscles that you're going to be using.